Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome back. I hope that you had a good Thanksgiving break. I know it's been uh, really treacherous and weird weather for the past few days getting back. So if you traveled, hope that you made it back safely. Um, if for our remaining class meetings, you're still um, running into issues with travel um, and are not able to safely come to class at any point, just let me know and I will send you a Zoom link for that meeting. Um, again, I don't want you to hurt yourself coming to class. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, moving ahead as we get into the final couple weeks of the term. So hope you had a good time. I was um, spending the break out in Salt Lake City, uh, visiting my partner's family um, out um, around the Springville area. Um, we had a lot of food. We played Super Smash Bros. It was a whole bunch of fun. So uh, it's good to be back and uh, good to uh, come into these last couple weeks. So I've got a whole bunch of updates for you, um, some things that we'll be working on, and we'll be diving into some of the last uh, things from the course uh, for this month. So way, way back uh, before the break, um, we spent some time talking about some of the ways in which um, there are strategies that are used to try to discredit or hurt social movements in achieving some of the major goals that they have, right? So for instance, a uh, social movement uh, might try to use a legal avenue to shut down advocacy, or sometimes media has the ability to frame and portray an issue in a way that's inaccurate or distorted or designed to lose support behind the movement. Oftentimes through portraying the movement as violent if it was in fact peaceful, uh, or um, through restricting people from participation. So we spent some time uh, before the break talking about this, including the role of slaps, right? Frivolous lawsuits that are designed to um, stifle communication, even though um, there isn't a legal basis. We looked at the Wonderland and Grade 2K case in which um, People who were trying to ban Greyhound racing were given uh, the slack and not able to actually um, continue their advocacy. And then the measure failed uh, to ban Greyhound racing really narrowly. So um, I put this in context to say that as we're trying to advocate for social change, we have to think about and be cognizant and in many ways preemptive to some of these types of challenges and um, issues that might involve the use of power um, and loopholes in the legal system that can stifle efforts of change. Right? I think it's great to empower ourselves to a change, but also to recognize that these uh, constraints can make it a lot more challenging. So for today, um, I want to take some time to discuss a few different things um, and give you a landscape of the remainder of the term so that you know what to expect. Um, I know that we've had a few different moving parts, um, so I just want to be as clear as possible about um, what the last couple of weeks are going to look like and what to expect as we're getting into final assignments of the term. Um, and then we'll be looking uh, for this class and Wednesday's class about issues and topics that are emerging in communication for social change. So I'm looking forward to us getting into um, some of the new kind of upcoming um, and major topics that I think will continue to impact us going forward. Um, we've got a, kind of a unique collection of trick pieces for this week for our last set of new readings. Um, we have a piece that we'll be looking at in more detail for today that's talking about the strategies of food justice and particularly using the idea of a tour um, to show and display the experiences um, that individuals might have um, in experiencing food injustice. Um, and then on Wednesday, we'll be looking at the other two pieces, one that's examining um, the use of motherhood as a strategy to um, move toward environmental justice, and then a piece that's looking at um, indigenous protests and activism, including indigenous use of social media um, in response to um, land grabs uh, throughout the world. So we'll have a whole lot that we'll be looking into that I think helps us to get a picture of what things look like in social movement communication more broadly. So um, we'll be looking into that for both today and Wednesday's class. Um, so we have a couple folks who um, are not going to be in next week due to athletic travel. 
Um, and they've arranged um, for me, since they're not going to be able to attend um, next week in any capacity or to attend uh, remotely, um, to um, have the chance they're going to be sharing, putting together a video of their presentation. So um, part of Wednesday's class, we'll be seeing uh, these two presentations, um, having the chance to learn a little bit about um, what they're doing. And then um, we also have our seventh Canvas prompt that'll be due on uh, Sunday. The eighth and final Canvas prompt of the term will be um, on uh, Friday, December 11th. So I'll be uh, posting that for you next week. Uh, that'll be um, mostly based on um, you sharing and debriefing work related to your presentations, other presentations, um, as well as the ORA presentation. So um, on December 5th is when folks, uh, next Monday is from today, is when folks who are able to come to class uh, next week will be presenting. Um, so we'll be blocking out that day for them to do that. Um, because we have about 15 people in the class and two are gonna be um, sharing their work this Wednesday. Um, we'll be able to get through everybody just fine without um, you know, messing up the schedule at all. So we'll go through about um, five or so people. We'll take a break and we'll go through the rest uh, next week. And uh, the presentations are only five minutes. So it should be pretty short and pretty painless. Um, I know the presentation days can sometimes be a bit of a grind, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be interesting. Um, it'll be a good chance for us to see um, some of the work that you all are doing. So we'll be doing that next Monday and I'll be showing the schedule in just a minute here. And then um, next Wednesday, December 7th is, uh, as mentioned, when Oregon Rural Action will be uh, presenting. So um, I've asked the college to reserve us a larger room uh, where we can hear from ORA and have them share some of the stuff that they're doing. Um, I'm also going to, um, it's going to have a Zoom option for people who aren't able to attend face-to-face -face on the 7th. And I'll also be uploading the recording of that presentation so that people who uh, were not able to make it are still able to participate and view that remotely. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'll be asking us to take some time to think about uh, and um, plan for what they have to share coming up. And then uh, December 14th is when I'm asking you to complete the write-up where you're talking about your career movement presentation, the strategies that you used in that, uh, and just reflect on the process of developing that assignment. Um, and December 14th is also the hard deadline for any remaining assignments that you need to turn in. Um, basically, that's the deadline by which I have to turn in uh, final grades to the registrar's office. So just make sure that any remaining things that you have, that you're able to get by then. Remember that for the Canvas prompts, um, it's your top six. So if you've completed six already, congrats, you're golden. Uh, but if you decide to complete more than six, then um, I will drop your lowest ones and only grade your six best scores. So um, did want to let you know about all of that stuff coming up and give you a sense of what to expect. So um, I apologize for the delay in getting your grades posted for the social movement analysis essay. I was waiting on a paper um, for somebody who had an extension. So I just wanted to, I wanted to go ahead and just unmute that so that you could see it. Um, I'm also in the process of drafting the more in-depth comments for you. So you should be seeing those up on Canvas shortly. But before uh, that, I did want to give you some general feedback and um, notes about what I noticed from the essay, some general themes um, and feedback so that you know uh, what to expect going forward, perhaps for your other classes and some general ways that I looked at uh, grading the system. You'll also notice in your grade that it includes uh, the points that you received in the different sections of the rubric, right? So um, that gives you a sort of visual sense of what that looks like too. So um, the Overall topic selection, I thought was really good. You know, we had the chance to talk through a lot of your topics in class. A lot of you have sent drafts and been in touch with email, um, but I just really enjoyed getting to see the whole range of issues um, that you all talked about. 
whether it was about the legal advocacy strategies related to Title IX, uh, whether it was examining the intersectional rhetorical components of missing and murdered Indigenous women, right? There was a really um, interesting and engaged choice of topic. And I feel like the essays did a really good job of picking topics that you all really had a lot of knowledge and command of. And so I really enjoyed seeing you all dive into something that you were clearly really interested in. So I really appreciate that. Um, so that was great. Um, I think that the kind of across the board area that was a little bit less developed overall was in the evaluation section, right? So one of the things that I was asking you to do for this essay was to essentially look at and evaluate whether you found that this communication strategy was effective, whether it worked, and achieve the results that it was trying to do, right? Was it meeting the goals that it had set for itself? And there were some cases in which um, this was talked about in a slightly uh, less developed or a bit more vague of a way, right? I was really looking for some content that was getting into explaining, you know, maybe this communication strategy was really able to hit this audience and achieve its goal, but this one was not as effective and didn't really um, work or this got distorted or impacted negatively um, and actually hurt the movement, right? So there were some cases in which it was talked about in a, a less direct or clear way, but I did find that this section was a little bit less developed overall. Um, and I think one of the interesting challenges, right, of uh, writing a piece and engaging um, on topics like the ones that you all chose is that a lot of your topics are ones that you all have a lot of personal investment uh, and interest in, right? Um, and a lot of essays, people brought in their own experiences, their um, engagement, and their perspectives on those issues. And it's a challenging thing, right? Because when we're looking at social change and advocacy, oftentimes you're a part of or we see ourselves in the thing that we're studying. Uh, that's something that I recognize too, right? I'm a person with a disability and I study disability communication and social change. So that's something that you know we reconcile a lot. Um, so it's good for us to see parts of ourselves and engage with that in that way. There were some um, parts of some of the essays where it did feel like it was veering a little bit way, away from examining the movement itself and the strategies of that movement and more into a persuasive piece about your perspective um, and experience uh, on the topic. And while you know there were times where that was okay for the overall argument, there were some points where that was veering a little bit too far um, away from the focus. So continue to work on really the analysis and explanation of what's happening in that movement, what that movement is doing. Um, and again, I do encourage you to situate your own perspectives in a way that continues to fit um, in that project. But I did really feel like the use of conventions um, you know, citation style, paragraph style, and structure, all of that stuff was really solid. I did really appreciate um, the structure and um, conventions and general polish of the essays. Um, and the use of supporting evidence, including chapters um, from Crick or some of the supplemental readings that we did, that I feel like you all did a really good job of integrating in a way that enhanced the overall essay. So I think. Overall, um, you know, the grades were really good on this. I was really impressed with the work that you all did. Just wanted to offer a bit of uh, general feedback um, so that you have that uh, to supplement the um, more in-depth individual feedback that you'll have on this one too. I also apologize for the delay on the Canvas prompts. Um, there's been a number of assignments that for various reasons um, have been receiving late for extensions and other things like that. So I'm continuing to work through the backlog of that. You should see um, everything up to date by the end of the day on Wednesday. So um, Madison and Britt um, are traveling. Um, and so they made arrangements for me for uh, presenting uh, a video version of uh, their work on Wednesday. So we'll have the chance to um, see that. And then we'll have everybody else uh, who will be presenting next Monday. Uh, my understanding, um, uh, there were a couple of people who had a preference for like what time um, they wanted to schedule. My understanding is everybody else is able to make it. So I did receive a, uh, somebody who said that they couldn't make it face-to-face -face, but could make it remotely. 
Um, so um, that's uh, the schedule that we'll have. Again, it's only five minutes. So um, not sure what five times 13 is right now because my brain is tired from driving in the snow, but um, it um, will be able to get through everything with good time without needing to be rushed. Uh, maybe um, we can even bring in a couple snacks or something too, we'll see. Um, but I look forward to uh, seeing you present your work. Again, I have the rubric that's available for you as you're um, preparing for and working on that. So um, a few tips as you're getting ready for next Monday and for sharing um, the Create a Movement presentation. Uh, five minutes goes by really fast, right? I'm willing to give or take a little bit, um, but I encourage you not to go uh, more than a minute over or a minute shorter. I'll give you a, a grace um, minute as you're wrapping up to um, summarize your key ideas. Um, and so I really encourage you to practice timing yourself, right? Uh, take note of how quickly you're moving between different things. Um, and there's probably a lot of thought and effort that you've put into this movement. So I really encourage you to spotlight some of the major things that you really want to share, some of the highlights uh, that help us to best understand what it is that you're doing. Um, as a reminder, I am asking you to include some type of visual aid that can support your presentation. Uh, one really easy way to do that is to just use uh, slides like um, PowerPoint or Prezi or Google Slides or something similar. Just send me the uh, link or download link uh, so that I can access that um, ahead and pull that up for your presentation. Um, you can also choose a different type of visual aid if you have something like a poster or you have something you want to visually show. Uh, you can do that too. So the sky's the limit in terms of how um, you incorporate a visual aid, but I do want you to take some time to think about what that looks like and how you'll be doing that. And then um, I want you to take some time to really focus on A, what your movement is doing to communicate, right? So what is this movement? What is it saying or doing? So maybe it is um, a walkout, or uh, maybe it is uh, a social media campaign, right? Or maybe it's an education. And what is the communication that's happening here in the movement? Really make an effort to help us understand and see what it is that you're doing. And then uh, second of all, what are the things that you're drawing from um, in order to make this movement communicate? In other words, maybe you're really informed by this idea of intersectional rhetoric and combining, you know, using social media with the body and movement, or maybe um, your focus is really on using narratives and you're drawing from that piece, talking about narratives. So, um, you know, tell us what this communication is or show us what this communication is uh, and, um, inform us what you're drawing from and using uh, for this communication. So that's what I would encourage you to do as you're preparing. I'm also happy to look over your slides in advance, uh, or if you even wanted to practice in my office, you are welcome to do that too. Um, so let me know if you're having any additional um, questions or need help as you're working through that. So um, I want to give you a chance to uh, work through something here. Um, so, um, as part of your attendance, I'd like you to take some time to uh, write or type. First of all, um, I encourage you to develop an outline for yourself for your presentation. Since it's coming up next week, um, start to map out what your presentation might look like. Uh, what are you including in the parts or the slides of this presentation? Um, what visual aids might you be using? Um, and what guiding ideas or concepts are you going to be sharing with us? So start to develop an outline where you map out what it is that you are choosing to do for this assignment. Um, and then the second thing that I'd like you to do is um, take some time to think about um, ahead of next Wednesday's uh, presentation from Oregon Rural Action. What I know is that ORA is going to be presenting about communication strategies that we have used to reach farm workers of color in Eastern Oregon about COVID-19 health, uh, COVID health. Uh, particularly they've been using the radio campaign in Spanish um, as a major strategy there. Um, and one of the other initiatives they're gonna be talking about is the use of social media um, to promote access to safe drinking water. 
So knowing that, right, and knowing that they are going to share, um, I think, um, you know, they're excited to see us. And I feel like we can really impress them with some good questions and engagement. They are going to open up a period of Q&A um, after they present. So I would love to have um, you all have some questions for them uh, and really show off some of the things that you're thinking about and have learned. Um, so ahead of that, I encourage you to uh, develop a list of a few questions that you might be interested in asking. Maybe more details about the strategy that they use, um, the communication that they use, um, how they do outreach, the other things about the organization, and so on. So I'll give you some time to think about um, and brainstorm this as well.
give you about five or six more minutes here. You a couple more minutes here.
Anybody who would like some more time? Thanks for taking the time to do that. Um, I also noticed as you were working that um, my slides didn't save the ones that I was working on before class. So I re-uploaded them. So if you're using the slides that were there before class, I just recommend refreshing uh, and checking that again. Sorry about that. I just didn't save the changes that I made to it before class. So it's uh, <coughs> the old version of Borland. So thanks for doing that. Um, you know, continue to think about these questions. Um, again, I'll be giving you the opportunity to share um, and show off uh, some of the things that um, you would like to share to ORA. So thanks for doing that. So uh, for this week, as mentioned, we are looking at emerging issues in social movement communication specifically looking at the idea of a tour uh, as a strategy of activism that is physically moving and showing people a place that is not their own as a way of engaging um, in awareness um, and activism related to issues, and will be better understanding the topic of food justice. I'm curious, um, is food justice a topic that folks have heard discussed in like other classes or contexts? So a little bit here and there. I do, I do think it's a pretty under-discussed one, right? I think that it's it's one that I've had the chance to learn more about and I'm still kind of uh, wrapping my head around too. Um, when I was a grad student, uh, we were in um, kind of a doctoral seminar that was a chance for graduate students to share uh, their dissertations and graduate work. And there was a colleague who was really interested in the topic of food justice and was doing some really cool work that was examining um, community gardens and local organizing um, and helped me to kind of learn and unlearn a lot of things. For instance, um, we were talking and I used the term food desert and she corrected me um, and was essentially explaining that the term food desert naturalizes the concept of food inequities, right? That it's based on geography rather than it being based on power um, and inequities and distribution. So I think there's a lot that we can continue to learn and explore related to those topics. Um, so um, we've got a lot to dive into, and then we'll be looking at the other two pieces on the list. So uh, chapter eight, a quick food justice advocacy tour when mapping rooted regenerative relationships, um, much like their alliterations through planting just seeds. So this is another case study and specific example, right? It's looking at food justice initiatives in Denver, Colorado, um, and understanding how these initiatives um, were able to create uh, this idea of food justice um, and promote that in a way that supported local communities. And in the context of this class, I think we're especially interested in understanding how um, the usage of tourism and allowing um, students and people to explore and understand um, the efforts that members of the local community were doing towards food justice in the area, um, I think particularly can add to under our understanding of social change communication in better detail. So there's some key ideas that I think we can use to better frame and understand um, this idea. Uh, so one of the notion of interdependence 
um, and the studies of social movements. In other words, uh, when we're understanding a movement, we're understanding it intersectional, we're intersectionally, but we're also understanding the ways parts of this movement uh, are working with one another mutually. So one of the key points that comes from this reading is the idea that environmental movements and food justice movements, of course, are deeply connected, right? But food justice is also deeply connected to race and uh, racism. For instance, um, a lot of um, kind of vegetarian or vegan activism um, is not always um, situated in an intersectional context. Sometimes it is, right? But sometimes it doesn't engage with things such as uh, disparities in cost and access to resources um, that might impact populations. Um, intersectionality, again, pointing to the ways that multiple elements of marginalization impact one another. Um, for instance, there's an extensive discussion about the ways in which anti-Blackness is impacted um, and impacts um, the process of food justice and of heterogeneity, heterogeneity that there is uh, the connection and cross-pollination of uh, different movements and parts of that. Um, I really like uh, the example here um, that the reading pulled from Griffin, right? Um, the point that a social movement is always a becoming, right? Um, in Althusser is famous for talking about this identity, the idea of identity as always already become. That is, we are not fully formed, fully developed humans, um, we are constantly developing, reinforcing, uh, and growing as people, right? And when we see a social movement and advocacy, we're seeing um, change, we're seeing movement, we're seeing struggle. It's a constant do it, right? So it's, there's never really, um, if you're in a movement, right, it's changing, it's evolving, uh, it's not in a complete state until it's over. And that uh, food justice patterns and understanding food justice is a way that we can better trace and understand inequities in other contexts as well. So I think it's a useful uh, framework that we can use to enhance our analysis and understanding. So um, one thing that I think is useful here to understand the approach, and one thing that's mentioned here is uh, the idea of rhetorical field methods. Um, this is something that we've talked a little bit about when we talked about the Daniel Andre's piece about uh, place and space. Right, so Andrew, one of the main authors here, uh, Michael Middleton was on my doctoral committee. Um, these folks really are interested, not just in the study of rhetoric, but in situating and understanding how rhetoric and social change and communication plays out at the sites, right? One of the things that I find really interesting about the work you all are doing is that you're invested, you're engaged, you're interested, and perhaps uh, depending on the movement and advocacy, you might even be a part of it, right? Um, and again, if we think about the history of communication and social change, there is this kind of trope of the, you know, the white armchair professor who is analyzing this movement over here, is reading a text or watching a speech, right, uh, and is very detached and unengaged from the movement. And increasingly, we've seen a pivot toward um, communication research that's really examining and participating and being a part of that movement. What does it mean not only for you to study a movement, uh, but also to be included and a part of uh, and involved by that movement, right? Um, Aaron Hess over here put forward the idea of kairos, of motion, of movement, of things happening in an event and situation that are unique and really stand out in a way that you can't fully put into words, right? He uh, does a lot of research that studies um, Dance Safe, which was designed to um, promote um, social spaces and parties in which people um, are aware um, about, um, you know, the usage of um, unsafe uh, drugs or harmful material that can be predatory, right? Um, commonly referred to things like roofies, right? So there's been a lot of uh, discussion about how those spaces, by being involved and participating in them, let us learn new things that we wouldn't see if we were just detached researching from the outside. So if you're a part of the movement and you're like in it as you're studying it, um, that's something that I think is useful. It's part of my research, I was at the Portland airport the other day, right? And was exploring and understanding a new sensory inclusive space that they built uh, at the airport, right? So that's an example of how uh, we might be involved in the things that we choose to look at. 
In this case, uh, one of the authors, Pedro Pizzullo, um, was um, part of this food justice tour, uh, planting just seeds, uh, and it was organized by the University of Colorado Boulder's Environmental Center's Eco-Social Justice Team, uh, which is a mouthful, but uh, helps us to understand um, the background that this is coming from. Pedro Pizzullo also wrote a piece about toxic tourism um, in which she was examining how um, the Toxic Links Coalition uh, was an adv advocacy group that took people on a tour of sites that were used by National Breast Cancer Awareness Month that were um, kind of creating pollutants and chemicals in the manufacturing of some of the uh, breast cancer awareness um, memorabilia in a way that was highlighting how, despite promoting efforts at breast cancer, some of the companies and organizations were creating toxins and harmful substances that were actually contributing to the problem to some extent. So uh, her background in tourism is a useful framework for us to understand what's happening. So an advocacy tour is a key idea that uh, Pizzullo lays out here in this chapter. Right, the role of rooted cartography. Think about cartography, we think about the study of maps, the study of geography. Um, and this idea of how we come to understand land, ownership of land, of course, has been heavily rooted by indigenous populations, by uh, land grabs, by legacies of violence and colonization. Um, so it's important for us to think about how in many ways, right, these situated constraints impact access to food, um, the role of relational food justice and regeneration. So regeneration gets brought up a lot in this chapter as this idea of reinventing and recreating uh, space and elements of communication. We might think back to the space and place piece and think about how locality and location is this constant invention and reinvention, right? We use communication to create new meaning to place and space. Remapping, uh, Pizzullo argues challenges, hegemonic cartographies or ways of thinking about geography. Again, a good example of this is to think about a concept of a food desert, right? A food desert implies that a place is geologically predispositioned to not have uh, good access to food, no matter what, it's not gonna be good, but, we know with the ability to transport and distribute materials, that that's not necessarily the case. It's more about how that food access is distributed. So maps can redefine uh, systems and impact on marginalized communities. So creation of things such as community gardens um, are examples of how marginalized communities recreate and reinvent location and use communication in a way of uh, advocating on behalf of food justice. So I wanna share a short clip that goes into some of the details related to food justice that can provide a little bit of a crash course into understanding what this movement is about um, and help us to situate it in a broader context to some of the work that we've been doing in this course. It says record. We flipped, you know, in our generation, we eat out every day of the week and right. maybe cook every now right. and then. Right. Total reversal. It's the total reversal. So if we go back to doing what our grandparents did, you know, more for, you know, you always had two, three vegetables mm -hmm. with dinner when grandma was cooking. Right. All our folks didn't fight this hard for us to get to this point to find that the biggest threat to our children today could be their own health. I was watching TV the other day and I've seen Michelle Obama's commercial for community gardens. And I was thinking to myself, the same thing that she was talking about, we were actually putting it into effect, educating the community about unhealthy foods and actually fixing the problem and supplying the community with healthy foods. Her words will be putting into action through the Black Ladies Academy. So these young men who came our first people back and said, you know, Mr. Sports, we want to do something. Right. We know what we're capable of. And we want to let the world know. 
one of the young men suggested doing after going through the ideas, all the young men were like, you know. Community garden is important because it's giving the community the opportunity to eat healthy. And the kids, they wasn't able to go down to the supermarket and be able to afford the vegetables and fruits that's been within the supermarket. They go down to the community garden. So we got to mention and then we go wreck the garden. Summertime, last summer, that summer I just passed. All I was doing with the garden, 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 garden. It was so hard, hot, sweaty, pain in the back. The garden, before we put all the work and effort into it, was nothing but a flat, big, desolate area with nothing but gravel and a big stone square in it. It looked like the bugs in it, crumbles, rocks everywhere. There. As they began to turn this land over and dig into this gravel, they started finding things like Broken crack pipes, broken lot of trash, broken bottles, and knives in sight. And they were like, you know, we don't want this stuff in our community. We don't want crack pipes in our community. So they cleaned that lot up, they cleaned that space up. And we had to break the concrete in, solid piece of concrete, with a big amount of it. Moving the mulch around, watering, digging. Things start to level ground, start to happen. To act. They got rid of that debris and turned it into these young men and the students in the school learned what they do. They learned what they do. So that's a, I think, a useful example here of looking at the issue of food justice and food advocacy, right? Oftentimes, when the topic of obesity, um, or health is brought up, right? It's brought up in a very individualized way. Like, oh, you're obese? Well, uh, that is your choice and you need to eat healthy foods. And I think one of the things that the video pushes back against that to say is that um, the access to things like healthy food are not necessarily equitable, affordable, uh, and capable, right? So not only can we think about that, but we can also think about how the place is reinvented, right? The turning a space that might have trash and garbage uh, into a space like a community garden and inventing that space, not only to be equitable, but to reshape what that place means. Well, that's a part of this idea of food justice and food advocacy. So there's a lot of efforts like that. Um, been a, there's been a lot of discussion related to things such as mutual aid over the last couple of years too, um, and other efforts that are trying to promote this idea of food advocacy and food justice. Another reason we should care about this, right, is to think about the fact that all of us need to eat. And uh, one of the arguments made here is to not just think about this as food, but to think about it as power, right? If we think about food as a resource that is not always equitably, equitably available, right, that is a way of thinking about the role of power in that way. So food justice is seeking to center experiences, voices, and advocacy of people who are hurt by the food system. Um, one example is people like unprotected farmers and food service workers. Again, we've looked at this a lot in uh, labor movements. We'll also be hearing more about this from ORA and their experience talking about farm workers of color in the region um, and also working class poor uh, producers and consumers as well. Again, um, the cost of goods and services um, oftentimes, the educational gaps as well. Um, assuming that people know how to make a healthy meal or know what goes into something like that, um, oftentimes there's disparities in access to that education and information as well. Okay? So um, this is pushing get back against a lot of the frameworks that say, you know, you should go on a diet. This is a choice, right? Um, there's a lot of narratives that we can unpack from that set of assumptions and stereotypes, and I think one of them. Um, is assuming the agency of an individual in making some of those choices that are oftentimes more structural in nature. So food advocacy is looking at the politics of production, distribution, consumption, and disposal, particularly in finding strategies to resist practices that might be unethical um, or harmful. Uh, we'll be talking more about this on Wednesday, right? But one of the things that 
um, is brought up in environmental activism is uh, the strategic hiring consulting to find places for waste sites where they think there will be loose amount of people who are resisting and protesting those sites. Right, that's um, a bit of a problem um, and an example here of how uh, advocacy can um, identify and push back against those issues. As mentioned, some of the ideas of uh, such as a uh, food desert or the idea of food enterprise or security. Um, this article is pushing back a little bit against because they're arguing that it's using a normal status quo frame as a way of trying to create change versus this idea of food sovereignty or food justice. Sovereignty, of course, being this ability to have access to safe food in an individual. Um, and then there's also um, other frames for us to think about in terms of the role of anti-Blackness and reframing of uh, food justice in that way. That the idea of the costs, the access, the role of gentrification um, in access to food, right? Uh, for instance, um, in communities of color, there may be fewer opportunities for access to healthy food. Um, and, um, you know, there is a white neighborhood with whole foods. So that um, is an example here about how some of those things might interact with each other. Uh, again, uh, I split my time between La Grande and Portland, and I have seen a lot of uh, this at play in Portland, for sure. So, um, I think another useful thing to look at here is that this um, study was conducted in Denver, right? Um, the Planning Just Seeds Tour in Denver area. Um, and um, this is uh, an example of a location that has seen significant growth and gentrification over time um, that we know connects pretty closely to exploitation and extraction of resources, right? So, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of context here to understand. Uh, some of the things that are going on in Denver. So there's a really useful map that lays out uh, some of the uh, parts of the city. So as you'll notice, uh, a lot of the areas in the middle of town um, can see some of the more advanced gentrification um, in terms of median home value, um, race, so on, right? So a lot of these areas in the center of town are scoring at this higher level. Um, we also see a lot of locations that see a more exclusive um, participation in a lot of the suburbs too. Wanted to share a little video that gets into some of the elements of this too. And displacement. Story of a lot of parts of Denver. One artist has decided to tell the story of his experience in a play. My hood is an heirloom, a prayer passed down. Uh, my name is Bobby Seeley. I'm a writer, performer, and socialist. But who will ask me where, where I live? Uh, it depends on who's asking me. If I think that they'll have some cultural context, I'll tell them I'm from the North Side. People will then sometimes come with these monikers back at me, right? Like, oh, so like, low high? Now they are calling it the high end. Bilingual bookstores are now being seen. So we bought this house right before the real estate market just got completely, you know, inaccessible. My family has been in this for a long time. My my grandparents bought their home in the 1960s. Uh, my grandma still lives three blocks away from me. That sort of neighborly spirit of the neighborhood that we had before is sort of, you know, being erased. Now they flock to the lot. They all armed with developers fighting out a new place to live. My house was built in 1945. Uh, it's a uh, you know big bungalow, uh, and the house next to me that has gone up is um, a modern, boxy, spacious looking thing. I don't quite, I'm not quite sure what to call them just yet. All these brick bungalows, they have front porches, right? And now all these modern builds, they have rooftop decks. So who do you talk to if you are sitting on your front porch and your neighbors are up on their rooftop deck? As an artist, I think that my job is to bring issues to the forefront. In a way that's responsible and authentic to the way that we experience our lives. Hopefully, through this theater piece, we can sort of put a microscope on, on the issue and, and really give it some humanity. Now, don't get me wrong, the body I knew is not always an ideal place for a flower to grow. There was a community that struggled. We have to look up for each other as neighbors. And if you don't talk about these things honestly, there's no communication with them. North Side. So, uh, I think an interesting example. Uh, 
Um, and again, the use of something like performance, I think is especially interesting to put into context um, some of the issues that are happening in the region that's discussed in this piece. Um, so for this study, there were 26 students and faculty who attended a tour in which a lot of gardens and sites of food justice and activism in the Denver area were happening, right? So Zulo helped to lead a variety of students and faculty who were attending the tour, right? As I mentioned, uh, she also is familiar with the role of tourism and somebody visiting the site uh, for uh, advocacy. This idea that tourism is not necessarily being, you know, somebody that's culturally insensitive, right? Uh, tourism is not the um, the um, white person in the Hawaiian shirt that's making culturally insensitive remarks. In this context, she's using tourism to refer to how visiting and attending a site as a spectator lets us become more educated and aware of the issues impacting members of that community. So uh, let's take a break. And when we come back, I'm gonna ask you to take some time to uh, explore um, some of the major ideas uh, from this article in groups. So um, let's come back at about 2.05, 2.06. Um, and then I'll be asking you to, um, I'll be splitting you to explore some of these major themes and we'll be uh, exploring them together in the ways that they were present um, in uh, the tour study for this chapter.
So what I'd like us to do now is um, starting on page 305, there are three major sections of uh, this article that you get into some of the major themes and concepts that emerge um, from conducting and studying this tour. And I'm gonna assign um, one of these for each of the groups and I'll ask the groups to uh, share and report back on uh, what they noticed about how this theme was present in the tour and how this assisted in the communication or argument that was trying to be made here. So, so uh, let's do one, two, three, and four. One, two, and three. Then we'll do one, two, and three. So the first group will have you do cartography. Second group, uh, relational food justice. And the third group, regeneration. So take some time to explore through those readings. Uh, they are marked on uh, the different sections with some headings. Um, I'll give you about uh, 15 to 20 minutes to uh, work through this and we'll report some of the things that you noticed together.
you about three or four more minutes to chat amongst yourselves. Any groups who need more time? So let's talk a little bit about this together. Um, so let's have um, each group share some of the things that they noticed about uh, this theme um, and the way that this theme was present uh, in the tour that was happening. So why don't just here? So let's go ahead and get started with the cartography group. So um, what were some of the things that came up for you all? So the book defined the first section of the book as the aggressive search on possibility of course to encounter mapping tactics, experiential learning opportunities, and embodied encounters. Basically, like along the story, they were able to go and actually see um, how food inequality is affecting communities. Mm -hmm. It's really shown that the um, marketplace founder, Beverly Grant, said that the area was not actually a food desert, but it was actually a food swamp. However, um, it was just the result of zoning and 50-year urban, 50-year urban climate, and not about equality. Mm -hmm. And we pointed out that after the whole tour and the learning process, um, one of the nine students responded, response kind of stood out to us as they said that it's not about helping others eat quality food, but it's about helping others know that they deserve quality food and systematic, not the fault of their community. Mm -hmm. um, and then one last thing that uh, someone pointed out was that the tour became, food became one lens through the, through the multiple systems of power and could be analyzed in Relations to examples of settler, colonial, and racial dynamics, land access, housing, labor, um, and health disparities. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so, um, so, you know, you've really done a great job of uh, mapping out a whole bunch of different parts here, right? So, um, I particularly like this uh, point that you raised here about how um, cartography and re-envisioning um, and um, kind of remapping as um, the authors talk about in this chapter is about recognizing that no, this is not a food desert, but that things such as a zoning, inequality, gentrification, and other practices have um, structurally made uh, this location such that there's not equitable practice, right? Um, and moving away from an individual frame, as you mentioned, of blaming um, a person 
who's not eating quality food, but better understand that they deserve access to food and that it's on um, you know, communities and groups who are not providing that in an equitable way uh, to do so, right? So I think that that's highlighting some of the importance of uh, shifting and remapping the narrative surrounding that as well. Uh, so I appreciate um, the examples and depth that your group brought in. I think does a great job of helping us to think about some of the ways that this is shaped um, and changed. Let's look at the relational food justice group. Kiana, uh, I think your group did a great job of exploring this in more detail, right? Um, and I think one of the emerging ideas is this role of networked advocacy and social change, right? That a lot of the social change that we're seeing is not from a large organization with a single leader, but it's through um, these kind of local network alliances and groups. Uh, some of these community networks, uh, gardens, and advocacy spaces, um, developing a plan that is engaging in a kind of local um, and situated space too. Uh, again, in setting disability activism, ADAPT, which is one of the nation's largest um, activist groups, has largely kind of fallen apart, right? And in its place, we're seeing a lot more community uh, and networked um, kind of on the ground groups. And this is a trend that we're seeing in this country too, that there is a very community driven uh, localized form of activism that is using those local community relationships as a method of um, pursuing um, food justice in this way. And how about here, the regeneration group? So, regeneration groups merge and access them for the community and the An example would be the same cafe where um, the guides were basically baked bread together with the guests. And they could eat the whole food in exchange of donations or volunteering. Mm -hmm. And it provides a sense of community where they can talk and it goes beyond the actual food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then another cause of the new generation was new fossil fuels because it affects people of color and it results in non profit sites that have to be created. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, this idea of regenerating, right, of regrowing, and I think regeneration was chosen very intentionally um, to give it kind of a you know a garden. Uh, you think about like a regeneration of plants or something like that, right? So. I think that was an intentional uh, rhetorical choice, but um, an ethic of care to connect communities, right? Um, regardless of the holidays you might or will be celebrating, right? Uh, generally speaking, it's not just that you are celebrating a holiday because of food, you're doing so because of community, because of engagement um, and time that you're spending with other people. And this idea of doing so in this community setting through um, volunteering and support, through imagining alternate ways of providing support that aren't just um, 
you know, buy this, but instead to um, engage and be a part of the effort that that community is doing, uh, I think are really good examples here of how uh, this is re-envisioning and recontextualizing um, how communities who might be food insecure or lack um, food justice are pursuing an opportunity to do so. So um, I think all of these three themes together are helping us to understand um, what this tour is doing, right? This tour is educational in the ways that helping students and faculty understand what's going on in the region, but it's also educational for us to understand how engaging in sites, uh, participating in local communities, uh, getting involved and in making ourselves aware of the practices that these communities do to create uh, efforts towards justice in a lot of ways uh, can be useful, right? The fact that students in reporting this experience have these observations and discoveries were able to form uh, these connections and ideas and incorporate them into their own lives, um, as well as the ways um, that these themes show us network um, and situated aspects of communication for change, I think really um, adds to our understanding of these and a lot of other issues. So I appreciate your the group's efforts in exploring and looking through this. And again, I think this is a great addition um, to understand, think about like if we're, we've been studying movements a lot, we've been studying a lot of history, we've been reading a lot of things, um, we're looking forward and a lot of what the future of advocacy looks like is stuff like this, that is very localized, is community driven, is educationally driven, and is about kind of reinterpreting and reimagining how we associate um, something like food security or food safety um, in a different light um, in a way that fosters that type of community engagement. Um, so if you haven't done so already, um, please email or pass forward the individual work that you did earlier today. Um, you can um, share what you did in groups if you'd like, but that is not required to turn in. Um, so um, I will see you all again for Wednesday's class, uh, where we'll get into more of this stuff. Um, I hope you enjoy whatever the heck is happening out there right now. Um, it's Oregon, so you know we get intense snow for a bit, and then it clears up, and it gets blue skies, and then, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, but stay safe out there. Let me know if you're not able to safely come to campus, and I can support you in coming remotely. Uh, best of luck as you're preparing for your presentation. Let me know if you have any questions with that. And I'll see you again for Wednesday's class.